near-death experience is not some alien experience of humanity. It is historically, the Bible has maybe eight or nine near-death experiences in it. Historically, near-death experience has always happened. But more importantly, mystical experiences are a normal part of human life and always have been. It is my great pleasure to introduce our featured speaker for today, Reverend Peter Panagor. Reverend Peter Panagor, Master of Divinity, is an amazing person, and I know you are going to absolutely love him. He has had multiple spiritually transformative experiences, including many mystical experiences, as well as two near-death experiences. He's an extremely popular mystical teeth preacher <laughs> on multiple media for many years, a podcaster, and also an international best-selling author. And he's based in Maine in the United States. He got his master's degree at Yale University. I am truly delighted to introduce Reverend Peter Panagler. Thank you, Yvonne. It's so great to be here, everybody. Thanks to showing up, everybody, from all over the world today. I, I want to begin by talking about mysticism, and I would like to give to you an idea of what mysticism actually is. It's, a, it's an ancient word that has been misused for a long period of time. Back at the turn of the last century, there was a professor from Boston who grew up or actually began to work in Glasgow, and he was at Harvard University. His name was uh, William James. And his brother was Henry James, which you may know from literature. William James was a preeminent philosopher. And in his famous varieties of religious experience, he characterized mysticism with four marks. One, it's noetic. It's a kind of knowledge that is not linguistically based or physically based. You can have knowledge on how to do something that's physical, like swing a hammer, or you can have knowledge like how to read a recipe book, you know the knowledge of the language. Noetic knowledge is wisdom, and this is something that lodges inside the soul, which is not first in the brain. It is a higher level of wisdom, of knowledge, of noetic knowledge that is ineffable. That's another mark. It is unspeakable. When you have a true mystical experience, it's impossible to put it into language uh, without metaphor, myth, symbol, or simile. And so it's always whenever we speak about mystical experiences, we're one step away from it. If I were to say to you that my pencil is good, I have a good pencil. And I then said, the divine is good, using the same word. Well, if the divine is ultimate and infinite and, and, and um, unlimited, then how can it have the same quality as goodness as my pencil? So naturally, it has to move to a metaphor or a symbol. So the third is it's uh, passive. A mystical experience is passive. It, you don't make it happen. It happens to you. It enters into you or it pulls you out of you. It's not something that we construct. It's an, it's an experience that you have that is uh, novel and it is unexpected most often. And the last is um, it's transient. They all have a beginning and an end. Sometimes they last for very extended periods of time. Sometimes they're as fast as a moment. But in every single mystical experience, a person who has one has a transformation. We talk about spiritually transformative experiences. What happens in a mystical experience is that you have a shattering of self. Your self-identity gets dislodged from what it previously was, and you have new, now a new perspective, or more radically, a new identity. And the higher level mystical experiences, you end up with a new identity. And we'll come back to all of this stuff in a couple of minutes. So four points, noetic, transitory, passive, and ineffable. 
four characteristics of mystical experiences, near-death experiences fit in this rubric. Near-death experiencers have had, according to William James, mystical experiencers, uh, have mystical experiences, but so has someone who has been visited by a deceased loved one. A deceased loved one, you're, you, you've just lost somebody you love, and you are in sharp grief. And sometime within a period of time after the death, the deceased, your loved one, comes to visit you either in a physical way, in your room that you see, or in a dream state, this in-between waking and sleeping state, or deep in the dream, but it's a dream like no other dream. It's a dream that has a reality to itself. You may know that you're sleeping and may know that you're dreaming. And then there's this communication that happens. And sometimes it happens in language, but most often not. It happens without language as a direct download to your soul of love or beauty or forgiveness or uh, well-being or any combination of those things. And from that moment on, you may have been a believer before, you may have not been a believer before, but from that moment on, you know in the core of your being that your deceased loved one is not dead. They are still alive. And not only are they still alive, they still love you. And so from that moment forward, your grief shifts. So you still mourn and grieve, but now you are forever, forever with this one person, you know forever that death is not the end. That's a mystical experience. Marjorie Woolacott at the last uh, IANS conference gave a paper and in it she said that in her study, 48% of the population that she studied of about 350 people all had an after-death experience. Many people have mystical experiences. It may be it's Jesus coming to see you, or you have an out-of-body experience, or an indwelling experience, or, or a, you know, some a Buddha comes to see you. You have an experience that totally changes your perspective, and it shifts your understanding of yourself. And there are levels that this occurs at. But my point here is this, is that near-death experience is not some alien experience of humanity. It is historically, the Bible has maybe eight or nine near-death experiences in it. Historically, near-death experience has always happened. But more importantly, mystical experiences are a normal part of human life and always have been. They are, it doesn't matter where you are on earth or what culture you're in or what religious tradition you're in. We all have experienced the visitation from the dead. If not you, then someone you know. This is a human experience. Mysticism is a human experience. The problem has been that mystical experiences have been repressed. They've been repressed for centuries through society, through religion, through theologies, through, well, you don't bring it up at a cocktail party because someone might give you the, what's wrong with you look. But so many of us have had them and we've all told somebody. So it's this big public secret. Mystical experiences are fairly common, and they do have different levels. The reason why I wanted to begin here today is so that I can move right into, say, what Pim von Lommel has been talking about. That since the 1960s, with the onset of cardiac care, science has been raising the dead for 60 years globally by the tens of millions of us, so many so that now we are, well, we're all coming out of the closet. There are books and organizations like Spiritual Awakenings International that recognizes the validity and the actuality of near-death experience. There are movies, there are conversations. We're breaking the barrier of the taboo of mysticism. And there's only 
tens of millions of us, how many billions of mystical experiencers are there on earth that have not had a near-death experience, but have had a spiritually transformative experience that influenced not only their life as they go forward, but the lives of those around them as a result. Because one of the things that happens in a mystical experience is you gain a new identity. You become a new person. You experience a psychological shattering. I experienced a psychological shattering in every single mystical experience I've ever had. Every one of them reformed me in a deeper, more refined way, in a way that helps me reorient my, my heart and my mind toward singleness, toward the oneness of being. Because I, as a result of my, what happened to me, I know I am not even a human being. I, I live as an avatar inside my body. I know I am not here. I know I'm above in the cloud. I see through my eyes. I feel the world through my hands, but I live inside this thing, and I'm bigger than this thing. Mystical experiences give you, give higher level mystical experiencers, experience compassion, kindness, and humility. Those three things, when the self-identity dissolves, even in a flash, one comes back with the recognition that one is maybe, yes, the fullness of light, but not the complete fullness of light, because it is so much bigger than my own soul consciousness, that I am a part of that ocean, but only a part until I fill, get filled with the light so much that I obliterate, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Mystical experiences aren't, it's not theoretical, and it's not passive. Actually, it makes you active and practical. Mystical experience changes a person in such a way that going forward in your life, you are different than you were before. And the reason why I wanted to start here today is because I want to, I'm trying to break down the wall between near-death experience and other kinds of mystical experiences. Through all through history, there have been people like Rumi and Lao Tzu and Jesus and Muhammad and Chuang Tzu. And there's a long, long, long list. Julian of Norwich, Teresa of Avila, long list of mystical geniuses who have left, uh, left us records of what it is to be in the singleness, to be in the oneness of being. And this is the ultimate goal of the, of the, the, the pilgrim pilgrim mystic isn't so much to manifest themselves into the world as they are to step aside and die before they die so that when they die they don't die the step aside you step aside so that the light can channel through you into the world making heaven here so i, I want to make a big tent not because it's my tent but because the tent has already existed for hundreds of thousands of years the human experience of mystical experience goes back as long as there have been humans. I can't, I can't prove that. But because it happens to so many people for so long, we all breathe air. That's a normal thing. We've been breathing air for 100,000, 300,000 years. Well, this is true too. Although this one thing I cannot prove that it's as ancient as humanity. So I wanted to begin by talking about mystical experiences because I, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about my mystical experiences. I am a, I'm an oddball. I, am, I kept my secret for 20 years because I didn't want to lose my professional. And I worked in religion. I am not a religious person. Let's begin there. I'm not a religious person. I work in religion. I'm not a believer. I work in religion. I use language and history and um, the knowledge of others in order to try to construct a language to speak about the ineffable. But more importantly than that, I want to do, I, I want to be able to con communicate Shaktipad, the, the divine energy that radiates between us. Because this is, this is the, in, the ineffable is actually speakable through the divine energy that we all are. And when you sense and feel the, the energy of the soul of another, the light inside them, it's because the light sees itself. It's because it is everything that there is. It's in everything that there is. And what mystics experience is they peek behind the veil 
and they get a partial bit of knowledge. We all get a partial bit of knowledge. We don't get the unlimited knowledge that we can bring back here because we have our brains and we have our cultures and we have our filter systems. But all of us, everyone who's been touched by it gets a portion of it and brings this wisdom back. And this wisdom is shared, is to be shared. I kept mine a secret for so many years, but it leaked out of me every time I spoke, everywhere I went, every job I did. It was always leaking out of me, even if I never talked about it. This must be true. For most of us, even if you repress it, I was talking to a woman the other day about her near-death experience, that she was a scientist and she repressed hers. She had one maybe when she was 14 years old, but she's a science brain. She's totally science and she repressed it. But it, even though she denied it to herself, it influenced her entire life. Now that she admits it, she can look back and say, oh my God, this thing really did change my life. So I'm going to talk about my near-death experiences, but I decided today to tell you in the order that I experienced my spiritually transformative experiences. I'm not going to begin with my NDEs. I'm going to begin when I was five years old. When I was five years old, I had a new baby brother, and my new baby brother disrupted my life, and my nose was out of joint. And so I went out to my tree, I climbed my tree, I sat in my tree, and I, it was early spring, and the leaves of the two-toned spring leaves were, were dark on one side and light on the other, and there was a breeze blowing, and they're all flickering all around me. They're flickering, and they're flickering, and they're flickering. And I go into a, like a trance-like state, and in, 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 a, in an instant, there's a roaring inside me like a waterfall sound I'd never heard before, but it's speaking to me and it appears inside of me from behind me and surrounds me and is a, an entity of light and power and grasps me and takes me up my silver cord, my elevator to heaven, where I enter into an infinite void of eternal darkness that was also living and I was in an, a, an, a room, a transparent, like a big bubble. And it was this angel, this being of light that had carried me. It was this, this room. And it was also in the room with me. And I was in a light body. And suddenly the, the room, which was transparent, opened. And in came a, a, an entity that kept shifting shape and form. And I knew immediately it was the divine and it spoke to me and it said to me, and, and I, I, I should say that I could see myself in my body. I could see myself in my light soul and I could see out of my light soul. I was in my light body and I was out of my light body, two perspectives simultaneously. And this, and I knew that this was the true me, that I wasn't the little boy in the tree. I was living as a little boy, but this, as soon as the divine spoke to me and said to me, you belong to me, you work for me, you've always worked for me, you've always been my, my, my being working for me, and immediately I knew that this was true. And then I was sent back. And I'm back in my body in the little tree in my little yard. And I climbed down and I ran inside the house to tell my mother. And um, I woke up my brother and fortunately he fell back to sleep, but it came, I had been banished from the house while he slept to go play in the yard. And my mom said to me, because I said to my mom, oh, I saw God, an angel came to me and I went to heaven and God spoke to me. And my mom looked at me and said, oh, you're going to be a priest. I was raised Catholic, uh, Orthodox and Catholic. And she said, oh, you're going to be a priest. That means you're not going to have a wife. This is 1960 something. You're not going to have a wife like me to care for your, your, your house. And she's ironing my dad's sheets uh, or shirts rather. And uh, she, she said, uh, so you're going to begin that now by learning to dust the dining room and do it quietly. So as punishment. So I learned in that moment, um, to keep my mouth shut. A year later, and it left me different. I asked my mom about this because I've talked to my mom about all this now. Um, and she said, you were a different sort of child. You were just kinder. And 
a year later, my dad uh, accidentally rode, killed my puppy, drove over him in the driveway. I'd had the, because my nose was out of joint, my parents and my brother had moved into my room. My parents bought me a puppy for my birthday. And then my dad accidentally ran him over and killed him. And, and that was the same week that my brother had moved into my room. And I was very upset and I fell asleep in my bed and I heard my name being called and I understood that I knew this voice. And so I woke up and listened and it was saying, Peter, 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 come to me, come to me, come to me, come to me. And so I, I rose up, I sat up and I opened my eyes and the whole room was illuminated in sepia tone, but there were no night lights in the room. The door was open, a crack, but the room was, I could see everything in the room. And I stood, and when I looked down at my feet, my feet were floating off the floor. And I looked back at myself in my bed, and I was still asleep. And the voice kept saying, come to me, come to me, Peter, come to me. And so I went. And as I reached the door, my hand went through the knob. And it said, just walk through the door. So I went. I went through the door and I went to the top of the stairs and on the landing, the flat landing on the stairs was a little tiny elephant. And this little tiny elephant was dressed in Indian garb. And now you got to know, I'm, I, I lived outside of Boston. I was raised Irish Catholic and Greek Orthodox. I knew nothing of India. But I, this elephant called to me and telepathically, and I floated down the stairs and I came eye to eye with it. And when I came eye to eye with it, its eye was black. The fullness of its eye was black and it's the kindest eye with the sweetest voice speaking inside of me. And I fell into the eye and it was, I swam in an ocean of wisdom. I was floating in this, this immense ocean that was so much bigger. The inside of the tiny little elephant was vast. And it was, it was compassion and wisdom. And then I was pushed back out again. And then it said to me, go down the stairs and go outside. And I knew in my brain and back in my bed, in my head, that it was bad for me to do this, but I was going to go because I felt this love. And out the door I went and I was told to look up in the sky and the elephant was still with me inside of me, speaking to me, although it was still on the stairs, paradoxically two places at once. And I looked up and I saw millions of stars and then I flew into them. I was lifted into them and they expanded into infinity. They became in immense, enormous. Uh, I, I, and it was more than I could take. And it frightened me. And in a flash, I was back in my bed again. And then I woke, I woke and I searched the house and never found the elephant. But it left me different. I didn't tell my parents about it. So fast forward to high school. High school, um, my sister had vanished. She had run away, broke my parents. This comes into the story later when I die. But I wanted to kill myself in high school. And so I thought I'd begin by experimenting with drugs. And so I took a triple hit of purple microdot San Pedro cactus mescaline. And I had a dualistic, an end of dualism experience where the divine was inside of all of the nature that was around me and inside of me. And it was speaking to me, I am. I am all of this. I am in everything. And it changed me. And within months, uh, my I was in high school and uh, I was being teased by being called Peaceful Peter. Hey, there's Peaceful Peter. And that's when I began meditation practice. So enough about those kinds of out-of-body mystical experiences. I've had many more. I just thought I'd begin there. In 1980, I was in Montana away from my family as an exchange student, so I didn't have to be in the presence of my broken family. And I was 
a backpacker. I need to tell you, I was a backpacker since I was 11. I started winter camping when I was 11 years old. I um, was on the National Ski Patrol. I had done, climbed all lots of mountains in the White Mountains and the Green Mountains in New England and the Berkshires. And I'd climbed all through the West, the Northwest. Um, so when I decided to go on an ice climbing, snow caving trip in Alberta and British Columbia during spring break for 10 days, I, my parents weren't very pleased, but they weren't surprised. So I didn't go home. I, I found a climbing partner, a man who I learned to trust. His name is Tim. You can read about him in the book. And I'm going to stop right here and I'm going to share my screen and, and show you where I went. So I'm going to stop right here and I'm going to go to screen share. And let's see, that's my book. And here we are. This is the mountain. This is Cirrus Mountain. This is a 10,000 foot mountain. This is the backside. We climbed around the corner over here and I'll show you a picture of that. This is north of Jasper, uh, pardon me, north of Banff and south of Jasper on the Icefields Parkway. Right here through this pass runs the Icefields Parkway. The Saskatchewan River runs right alongside it. And here we are. This is Lower Weeping Wall. Lower Weeping Wall, this is a uh, this is this is this is this was the, the terminus of where are we? I want to see here. This is the climb here. This is the terminus of our climb was here. Um, this is the climb. It's a world famous climb called Lower Weeping Wall. People from all over the world come here to climb, and we were the we were the maybe I don't know tenth team, twelfth team to show up that day, and we climbed up this route like this. And um, I'm going to end the screen share here for a second. I'll just leave it up. Um, I'd never ice climbed before. I had, I had quite a bit of experience as a mountaineer. I'd used a lot of ropes. I've climbed a lot, of, a lot of rocks. I'd spent the same, this same year, I spent six weeks backpacking out in the wilderness. So I'd already been backpacking just this year alone, I, in the year 1980, 1979, because that's when I went out west. Uh, so I spent a lot of time in the mountains, in the high mountains. I was, in, I was an experienced winter person. I made a mistake, though. I, I was, didn't have enough money to buy my gear, so I borrowed gear and I rented gear, and I came up with one axe and one hammer. And you need two axes to make an efficient climb, but I didn't have it. And I was young and I thought I can do this. And Tim thought you can do this. My partner, my climbing partner, who was a certified lead climber on ice and rock. So we decided between us that we could do this. And so we did, but our climb took us a lot longer than everybody else's climb because with a regular ice ax, you can set this thing and then you can let go of it and you can dangle on it and rest, but with a hammer, you can't rest. You have to grip it with your forearm the whole time, which meant that my forearms burned out very rapidly. And so my climb was slower. And climbing is not like backpacking. If you're going backpacking or on a hike and you're having a bad day or the weather turns bad on you, you can turn around and go back down the same trail. You can't do that ice climbing. You can't go back down the same trail because there is no trail. There's the trail only goes up and then there's rappel route down. It's just the way it is. So I knew early on that we were in a seriously dangerous situation. We climbed to the top in the last hour, as we knew that the sun was setting, the danger became more pronounced. Like I knew, I knew that I could die here. I got to the top of the climb and Tim was waiting for me and the sun set. And as the sun was setting, the last team departed walking out to their cars just across the street in the parking lot next to the Saskatchewan River. And we knew it was dangerous because as soon as the sun set, uh, our temperatures dropped into this, the first stages of hyperthermia where muscles twitch, individual muscles twitch, and the whole body becomes uh, just a, a, like a, like they call it um, like a sewing machine. It's like all your little muscles are doing all individual sewing machines up and down, up and down, up and down, expansion, contraction. So our, our jaws were clattering, our hands were shaking. It was, we had, we, it was a day climb. 
we didn't bring up more food. We didn't bring up a stove. We didn't bring up extra water. We didn't bring up, uh, we didn't bring up a sleeping bags, nothing, just a day climb. So Tim hauled up the rope. I need to tell you that the rope was 300 feet in full length, but folded into 150 feet. So Tim pulled up this 300 foot rope and in our exuberance, pulled it up too fast and it became a 300 foot knot, a tangle. Sun went down, stars came out, we could see in black and white just barely. And we, we, we talked about the situation. I, I, as I, I had to untangle the rope, I'm good with rope. I can see, basically see with my hands with rope. So I had to take off my gloves and I had to untangle this um, with by feel. And we talked about our situation. And I need to say that this photograph that you're looking at, I took this photograph in 2016, when I went back and finally faced my trauma. And until 2016, I could never tell my story, which I kept secret for, for 20 years. I could never tell my story without crying because, because the terror, uh, I faced my terror. I went back and faced my shadow side. That's what this is about. It's the, what this picture is from. Um, and I, I reclaimed some of myself. That's where this picture comes from. But that night back in 1980, um, I was so, I, was so uh, I can't tell you the terror I was feeling. Uh, it, was a, it was the most terrifying night of my life. And we knew that we were going to die. We, we knew we were going to die. And we decided either we stay here and die, snuggled up with each other against the mountain, trying to conserve heat, because that's what you do when you have hypothermia. You snuggle with the people that you're with, try to conserve body heat. But we knew that we were going to die if we did that, because it was too cold. So we decided that we were going to, if we were going to die, we were going to die fighting our way off the mountain. So once I got the rope untangled, um, and our, as our, fro our, our frostbite got worse and our hypothermia progressed, I, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip a lot of the story for you. If you, if you want to uh, read all the details, and there's a lot of stuff, uh, um, I ended up, I ended up um, it's right here, you can read about it here. Um, all the details. We ended up getting arrested. We ended up going to jail. It's just this crazy. Ugh, I'm going back to that picture. I'll leave it on whichever one lands. That's where we're staying. We'll stay there because it's flipping around. Um, so we roped ourselves off and we traversed across the mountain and in the dark. We had three repels to make, and we made all three. Uh, <laughs> geez, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here. We made two. We eventually made all three. But by the time we made the second, the second repel, um, our frostbite and hypothermia had advanced so far that our feet were frozen like blocks of ice. And we had our brains were confused. Our eyeballs were freezing. Uh, um, yeah. Have you ever touched ice? You feel like it's fire? Uh, our whole bodies were on fire because our whole bodies were freezing. And my feet, by the time we reached the, the bottom of the second repel and the top of the third repel, my feet had stopped being on fire. They had gone beyond that. And we had made numerous mistakes through the night because of our confusion. And um, we were clipped into the mountain and I, I meant to load up a picture of this, but there's a, an iron pin in the mountain with a carabiner and a strap and a carabiner and we're hooked into the mountain on a ledge the size of say a, a conference table. Tim is to my left, I'm to the right. Uh, it's sometime before dawn. Um, we had just come down the last rappel. I tied the rope to my harness. I took off my gloves to do that. I laid my gloves on the, on the, the, at my feet. I tossed the rope off to the side. I put my gloves back on. I pulled the rope and the rope jammed. And the, the rope was bent around a corner of, a, of like a crag. And on the first pull up around the corner, it jammed into another rock crevice and I couldn't get it out. And it was the end for us because like we couldn't reascend. We could only try to pull on the rope to get it free, but we couldn't get it free. So by this point in the night, um, 
I became hot and I unzipped my coat as often happens. And Tim told me not to, but I did it anyway because I was hot. And I realized at this point, because I'd been trained in hypoth and I'd been on the National Ski Patrol and we were, I was working in a mountain in Bozeman and we'd been trained, retrained again on hypothermia this year. I knew what I was doing. I didn't care. And I also knew at this point that this was it. I was going to die where I was. And I remember looking out over this beautiful view. So this mountain over here around that corner, I could see down the way a piece, this mountain over here. And it was and the sky was filled with 10 million stars. The moon had risen so we could see better. And it was so beautiful. And this peace came over me. And when I gave up, I'd been driving myself forward all night long with Tim too, with, um, a singular mind of survival where, where only staying alive is the thing that matters. And as, as the night had progressed, we felt our energy drain. We felt ourselves beginning to die. It was this rush of deliberation, a deliberate rush as fast as we could against what we were feeling going on inside of our bodies. And by the time we were on this ledge and I had unzipped my coat, I knew that it was done. I was done for. And this peace settled into me. And I started thinking about my parents. And I started thinking about the divine and the end of my life and how my sister had vanished and had broken my family and that my parents were going to lose another child and that it would destroy them. And then I began to fall asleep. And sleep wouldn't come like snuggled up on a bed. <sighs> Sleep would come like a snap of the fingers. My brain would shut off. I, I, I had such exhaustion. I, had, I was so hungry. I was so thirsty. I had such exhaustion. My body shaking. A body trying to stay warm consumes energy. So I was out of energy. And my body shut off with sleep. I collapsed, hit the, the deck, the rock with my helmet. And that shock would wake me up. I'd stand back up again and I'd pull on the rope. And so I don't know how many times I went up and down, I got back up again. And this time I opened my eyes and then my peripheral vision was all black. And it was the final stage I came I, to find out the, the, because I didn't understand what was going on. The tunnel vision is the collapse of vision, just like this. And when it went to black, I lost consciousness. But in this loss of consciousness, I was expecting to fall asleep. But in this loss of consciousness, I didn't, my brain didn't shut off. Instead, I was awake and in darkness and out of pain. And I was floating. And I didn't understand what was going on. And in front of me, and from now on, I use metaphor and timelessness. Because there's no language to talk about this. In front of me became an infinite darkness. And this darkness, way far in the distance, tens of billions of light years away, this little tiny star appeared. And this little tiny star rushed toward me faster than the speed of light across this entire distance, filling my vision as it came and spoke to me telepathically, non linguistically directly to my soul, to myself, saying to me, I'm taking you. And I said, no, you're not. And I took all of my willpower that I had survived the night until that point with, the drive I had. I, I, developed, I developed such a capacity for drive inside myself that night that I have not ever used the depth of it for the whole of my life. I've never gone back to the place, the, the, the depth of what I dug that night. And I put all of that up as a shield, my will. And this entity reached through my shield like a paper and grasped me, grasped me and pulled me out. And I was inside it. I was inside this bubble of light, this intelligence this, it was intelligence, and it was brilliance, and it was comfort, and it was power. I, had, I lost all of my power. 
I had no ability to make any to make any of my decisions in actuality. I couldn't even move. I was inside of this as a rag doll, but comfortable and in contentment. And I could see out of it into the darkness and I traveled the route that it had come back. I traveled back in the route that it had come to me. And I was also outside of it, seeing myself inside of it. And outside of it, I had no form, but inside of it, I had a light body. I was still somehow somewhat shaped as a human, but I was no longer a human. And we traveled that in same distance at an incredible rate of speed. And then either the entity, this angel, this being of light opened and I ejected from it, or it became, or it melded into this much vaster, infinite, eternal darkness this illuminated darkness. It was this place of paradox and equal opposites. It was darkness as far as I could see. And I could see further than I had ever seen before. And it wasn't just in one direction that I could see. I could see in every direction at once. And I was in an eternal, infinite ocean of darkness. But because there was illumination there, I could see the darkness extending to infinity. But I could not see it, the origin of infinity. As far as I could see, I still could not see that. And I was, a, an, I was much larger. I described myself as an orb of consciousness, an orb of energy. I had no brain. I, I had no body, I had no molecules, there were no things. This was a place of no thingness. No, I was no thing, I was nothing in nothingness. But this nothingness had a fullness and I had a fullness to myself because my thinking was my being, was my seeing, was my understanding. And I had no brain in the way of my thinking. I was able to comprehend all of this in a, in, in a flash. And I knew this is my true self, that I had never been Peter, not really, ever, that this always has been me. I've always been this thing. And in that moment, in this timelessness, a, a, a door opened, a portal appeared, oh, 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 the light appeared to me. It was massive, and it was flowing, and it was, a, it was solid and translucent and transparent all at the same time. And I could see its surface and I could see its depth and I could see through it into a deeper eternity leading into the infinite, leading to the infinite itself. And the light was this shimmer flow, of 30 billion colors, all white, all millions of billions of hues and tones of all these different colors and all, all color and all white simultaneously, and it had flow, and it called to me. It spoke inside of me, from outside of me, and it compelled me. I was, had this compulsion to touch this. So with my orb self, I touched this flow of light, and as I touched it, it filled into me, and then all of the expanding me, and then all of these things happened at once. And I tell, I tell this story sometimes in one sequence and sometimes in another sequence because this is timelessness. The, all of this happened in an instant. There was no chronological explanation uh, to me of, all, of this unfolding. It was all at once. And so today I'm going to talk about hell first, my hell. I went through a hell of my own making. I suffered all of the pain that I gave away in my life from the interior emotional chemical wash and thinking of every single person I'd ever hurt in my life. I was inside of them in every single incident in a chronology from the beginning, um, person after person, experience after experience, and simultaneous to being inside of all of the pain that I created in the world, in the vision and experience of those I gave it to, I was also myself thinking why I wanted to hurt them, 
feeling my emotions that I wanted to, my emotion that caused me to hurt them, my reasons for wanting to hurt them. And this was all simultaneous. It all happened together. And so as this all happened together, I found that the, the suffering that I gave away was enormous compared to what I thought it was when I gave it away. And I felt their pain and I felt my emotions and I, I judged myself guilty, not because I was bad, but because of the ultimate, infinite, unlimited nature of the divine love in which I was awash, speaking inside of me. I love you. I know you. I've always known you. You're naked before me. Nothing of you is unknown. Everything of you is known. And I love you as you lived. I love you as I made you. I love you with all the things that you did. And I saw all of humanity at once. And I saw all of the pain that everyone causes everyone else in comparison, not to each other, but in comparison to unlimited purity. And I realized and understood that it's not my fault. It wasn't my, I made choices as a human being, but the whole coding of the whole universe from black holes consuming entire star systems to viruses eating human beings, we all consume something and hurt something else. It is the nature of nature. As Jack London said, red in tooth and claw. Not my fault. I didn't make it. I lived it and made choices. But the love with, that was given to me in my life and the love that I gave away in my life, all of that became the ear of my heart. And with the ear of my heart, of my soul, of myself, I could hear the voice of the divine speaking. The whole heaven I was in was the body of the divine. The presence of the heaven of, of the divine was next to me, but I couldn't see the totality of it. And it was inside of me. The whole thing was a, a frequency of communication to me. I love you. I love you. I've always loved you. I've loved you since, since I made you and called you into being. And as I listened with the ear of my heart, as I heard this forgiveness, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I've always loved you. I heard and turned toward it, and all of the pain that I had ever had in my life fell from me, like um, Jacob Marley in A Christmas Carol and the Chains We Forge in Life, which Christmas Carol talk about a near-death experience. If you never read A Christmas Carol with that in mind, Think about it next Christmas when you read a Christmas carol or you see it. All of my humanness fell away from me. And I was infilled with this oneness, this unity, this singularity. And it was light and love and beauty, awe and paradise and understanding and knowledge and adoration. And I expanded in this. I, it blew me up like a balloon. I became bigger and bigger and bigger in the oneness of being. Inside of the truth of, of the infinite itself of which I am made. Through which I am known. And I saw the origin of my soul self. The voice says, said to me, says to me. Because this happened to me back then, but this is an ongoing thing in my life. It never shuts off. It's never shut off. And it says inside of me, it said inside of me, I made you. I make you. I am creator. You are a creature. And it showed me the origin of myself. I'm like a singular photon, of a wave and a particle form that can be superpositioned. I'm superpositioned. I am wave and particle, and I'm superpositioned. And in front of me, I see a septillion, 100 septillion times googleplex of photons that are the energy field of the divine self. And I am just like it. 
I am one single photon of this gugaplex of photons that create this intellect, this power that's way far beyond me, way bigger than me. But I am of the same substance. I am photon from photons made. And I saw the origin of myself. I saw the, the length of my soul, the eon of my soul. The breath and the width is ageless, everlasting. And inside of the length of my soul, I saw lives like a butcher block table. And I am the wood and the human and other lives I lived are the little tiny glued lines. They are so small in comparison to the enormity of myself and the purity of my being made from the same light. And, and because I was in timelessness, I could see that these lives were simultaneous from my point of view. They weren't sequential. And I was shown into them. I saw inside two of them. One was human, one was not. That's as much as I can say about it. Part of the knowledge, part of the experience of near-death experience is that you see 100%, but you bring back 1% or less than 1%. And there are things I cannot see, and I can't see more than that. But I also saw that the life of myself as Peter, that's not me either. The me who is actually me is this expanded self in the oneness of being. And inside of all of this being, this blown up oneness of being, infilled with unity, I, it was as if one more molecule entered in, if one more molecule had entered into my expanded self, I would have folded back into the unity itself. I would have, I would have obliterated back into the oneness of being. So much infinity was inside of me. And then I was reduced back to a smaller size. And in this smaller size, I said, am I dead? And the voice said, yes, you're dead. I said, but I can't leave. I can't leave my parents. Do I have to die now? And the voice said, no, you don't have to die now. But I want you to. I want you to come home. I said, my parents are suffering. And in an instant, I was swept across heaven in a flash, an incredible distance, fast as thought, to the edge where there's like a field of energy, like the Higgs boson field, where energy becomes matter, metaphorically speaking. And I was pushed outside, some of me was pushed outside of heaven into this place where energy becomes matter, and I could see the entire universe, our universe, I could see the entirety of our universe and all of the galaxies in it. And my, my vision was then swept to our galaxy and to our solar system and down to our planet. And I could see our planet like a hologram in front of me. And I could see 7 billion people all in live time, all doing 7 billion things, living human beings. And everything is covered with a huge foam. The whole planet is covered with foam. And the foam is between every living being. And they can't see what I see. And what I see is inside of every single one of them is, is gold. Gold light. The light of life inside them. Sparkling in every single one of them. No exceptions. And the voice says to me, in the way I love you now. And then I was awash with love. And this love was greater than the universe I was in and the heaven I was in. It was greater than universe upon universe. I saw that there were universe upon universe upon universe of love. And that this love was greater than I can ever express to you. In the, in the way I love you now, I have always loved you. And I knew this to the very core of my created being. And in the way I love you now, I have always loved you. And because of my love, all is, was, and will be well for everyone, because I love everyone in this way. And so your parents will come because of my love. You don't need to worry about them. Come home. And I could see my parents' faces. I could see their suffering in live time. And I could see two parallel lives. 
I could see their life without me and the suffering they would have having lost a son in addition to my sister, and then the lives with me, and a reduced suffering, not no suffering, just less suffering. And I could see, and I did not see this in my human life until weeks ago, after my dad died. But when I was dead, I saw the end of his life, and I saw the end of my mother's life. I saw them in heaven. I saw them in the divine love. I saw them well and whole and healed and like me, full of light and life. And because I saw their suffering, I said, do I have to stay? A voice said, no, you don't. I want you to. It's time for you. I said, if I go back, can I come back here? And the voice said, oh, yes, you can come back here. I said, I choose to live my life. And the voice said, you won't live your life. And flicked me out like a pebble off a finger. And as I traveled, it traveled with me, and I became denser and smaller. And it presented in front of me a million openings, a million doorways into hallways, into my physical life, each one a different life to live. And in the center of all of these doorways was a beam of light that was enormous. And this light was light and life. It was all living. And it, the entity, the divine, was so speaking to me as I traveled, it said to me, choose. And it wanted me to enter into the fullness of the light. But I wanted some autonomy. I wanted some selfness. And I chose more of me and less of light. Still close to the light, the door that I entered, but not in the center of the light. And I traveled down this hallway, and I saw all of the probabilities of my life. And I saw all of my other potential lives that I could have chosen. And I saw how they all intertwined. And I saw that if I choose light again and again, that I will worm my way back to the light center core. And then I was crushed down into a, a much smaller compact and screwed inside my heart and filled inside my body. And I, my brain came back online and I entered into suffering again and I was filled with suffering and pain. And my brain came online and Tim shook me and awoke me and helped me stand up. And when my brain came online, he was screaming and yelling, you were dead, you were dead. If, I, if you died, I'm going to die. And he's crying and, and pull on the rope. I pull the rope. The rope comes free. We descend. We treat for hypothermia. And we survive. And in the last five minutes, I'd like to tell you my second near-death experience. In between those two this one in 1980 and the one in 2015, there was a series of other mystical experiences, including uh, the loss of self and a, and a kundalini flash, all and many other experiences that helped me grow and understand how to deal with what I faced. But one of the results of my near death, my first death, was that I prayed for my own death every day for most of my life. Because as soon as I came back, I realized I'd made a mistake. I didn't want to be in this place of suffering anymore. I wanted to be in the, in the truth of eternity, the truth of wellness and wholeness and healing. And I, being in this world was like, like being inside a two-dimensional black and white cartoon uh, from the 20, early 20th century with all these flickers in it. Everything was, nothing was real to me here. I wasn't even real to me here. I knew what reality was and I wanted to be back there. And so every day I prayed for my own death. Also every day I prayed, I entered into a contemplative life, centering prayer practice and Kriya Yoga with, combined with Hatha. All of that led me to 2015. And since I've only got three minutes left, I'll make it very short. 
I died of a heart attack, congenital, inheritable. Killed my grandfather, killed my sister, would have killed my dad. But they life lighted him and saved him. I had 100% blockage by the time I got to the urgent care center. By the time I left the urgent care center, my golden hour of survivability was already over. They gave me a decoagulant. I had a, maybe a 3% trickle through in my Widowmaker and an hour and a half ride to the catheterization lab. The doc told my son who happened, to, who happened to be in town to say goodbye to me. Leaned in, looked in my face, squeezed my hand, said, I love you, dad. My wife who came, I said, I looked at her and I told her that I was waiting my whole life to go and that she knew that. And now's my time and I was going to. And off I went. But I, I decided, I had decided to try to survive because I owed it to my family. But by the time that my golden hour was up, I was going and giddy about it. I didn't take any morphine because I can't take painkillers. They make me nauseous. And they loaded me in the ambulance and off I went. I used meditation to control my heart pain, like an elephant standing on my chest on one foot. And as we're on this long ride to Portland, Maine, to the main medical center, I hear the paramedic say over the radio, we're losing him. And I opened my eyes and looked at her and she had fear on her face. But when she saw me looking at her, she put her game face back on. And as soon as I looked at her, my pain level increased enormously. So I dove back inside myself into my meditation. Meditation, you can stare at your pain and you can separate yourself from your pain. I can talk about that later if, you, if you're interested. Um, and once I was back inside, I went inside, but I wasn't inside my body, I was outside my body. I was in darkness and the same angel, divine being came rushing toward me, the same one I've known my whole life, speaking, it's time for you to come, come to us, come to us, we've been waiting for you. And I went and I started to go, I was like, hey, it's my time. And as I went, I thought I should think about my family before I go, I understand what's going on, I should take a moment here. So I look back inside myself, I say to the angel, hold on a second, I look back inside myself and I see my son, I, I see inside of my son's life, I look into his heart, I see he's not ready for me to die. He's not ready for me to leave. I look inside my daughter. She just left an abusive marriage. He'd gone off to Afghanistan, came back with moral injury, became abusive and um, just had a baby. And she had just escaped. And who was going to protect her or the baby? Who was going to be the father figure for the child, my granddaughter? So I turned back to the angel. I went back outside myself. The angel had receded and had come back and then came back toward me with this welcome, welcome, welcome. And I said, I'm staying. I didn't ask. I said, I'm staying. And I turned and I went back inside. And the next day, uh, I was another person again. And we end where we began. That every single depth, in the depth of mystical experiences, they're transformative. And they leave you newly made or in Christian language, born again. And now it's uh, after five after and I, I can stop now. Thank you, Peter. If you could please uh, stop screen sharing, then I will um, do so. Let me, um, let me take a moment here and Thank just you. show you um, this picture. This is on the theater tour. I went immediately on a theater tour afterwards, uh, 60, 24,000 miles, 64 shows. And, and this is my face, okay? This is like a week, two weeks, three weeks after. I'm in bliss. And this is, these are all the people in my theater company. I'm like totally launched out. And um, that I just wanted to show you. And I'll show you, uh, that's me in the back of the pickup truck on that theater tour two weeks later and my other book. And we end with heaven is beautiful. And I will end screen sharing if I can find my screen sharing button to do that with. Um, so if you'll continue on, uh, end slideshow, <laughs> click to exit. All right, I'll make there, that happen. There should be a little button at, at the top. I think yeah, there should is. be, but I'm not seeing it. Let me, <laughs> let me- uh, Stop screen sharing. I'm working. It's not seen, I, we had trouble, right?
We were so, having a little bit of technical problems. Pardon everybody. Well, as you're looking for the button, let me just say yeah. this is uh, Dr. Yvonne Kaysan again. Uh, thank you, Peter. That was an absolutely incredible presentation. Uh, let me see. The host can end the screen share, somebody says. So let me see how I'm able to do that. Yeah, do that. Stop the other screen sharing. Uh, okay, let me see. Yeah, or take away my hostness. Remove this me from hostability. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your suggestions, everybody. Yeah, that bar doesn't show up for me. I'm not sure okay, what I removed is. you as co-host. Yay. But unfortunately, it is still having you share the screen. Host only. Okay. Quit your PowerPoint. All right. I still can't find a, a, a thing to screen share, stop screen share. No, I would use it if I could find it, but I'm, I'm moving my mouse all over the screen and I'm not, it's not showing up. There's a glitch in the system. All right. Um, well, we're going to have to do the question and answer period. This well, way. take away my host. Can you take away my host? Please? I did already. Oh, you and did. And for some reason it has not, um, has not removed your ability to- Well, if it's okay with you, you know, I could drop out and pop back okay, in again. tell you what. Oh, there wait a minute. We there we go. <laughs> Found a way to do it. Yay. Anyway, okay, sorry, thank you. sorry for the technical problems, everybody. Anyway, that was absolutely fascinating, Peter. A wonderful presentation. We're now going to go into the question and answer section. So if anybody has any questions, please put them in the chat. The moderator for our uh, question and answer period will be Dr. Brian Sackett, who I'm going to bring on right now. He is the uh, uh, a board member for Spiritual Awakenings International, currently serving as our president. Uh, not as our president, as our treasurer. Sorry, I'm the president. And um, I'm going to leave, and Brian is going to take over moderating the question and answer period. Brian. Thanks, Yvonne. And yes, it was a mesmerizing uh, presentation, Peter. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions already. Um, uh, how about your sister? Have you seen her? Um, yes and no. Uh, my sister died in 2006 of a heart attack. Um, they thought she was murdered um, as it, it was crazy. But she was gone from our lives for a, an extraordinarily long time. Um, I was the only communicator with her for a period of time. I saw her once, twice maybe, before she died. Um, so, but in the very end, in the early 2000s, uh, I guess around 2004, six, something like that, um, she was living in South Beach, Miami, and we found that out, and my parents had gone to see her. So it was the beginning of reconciliation but then she died. She's come to visit my mom though. And um, a couple of years ago came with my grandparents and apologized for all the pain that she had caused. And, I, and my mom had a healing. So my, mom, my mom's first healing came when we knew that she was dead and my mom didn't have to worry about her anymore. And then the second healing came when she came to visit and for, asked for forgiveness. Thank you, Peter. Um, another question is, please tell us about the meditation to get rid of pain. Uh, oh, sure. Um, someone's calling me. I have to hang up on my friend here. Um, so the meditation to get rid of pain. I, I practice what's called centering prayer. And centering prayer is uh, developed out of Theravada Buddhism and uh, ancient Catholic mystical uh, experience primarily out of the Cloud of Unknowing and um, Teresa of Avila and a couple of others. But basically it's this, you have a, a prayer chant and you have your breath and you ride your prayer chant on your breath and you ride it up and down and you say it 10,000 times. And every time your mind wanders, you go back to your breath and your prayer. That same technique can be applied to pain. So if you have a breathing practice and if you want to practice, this is what you do, this is what you could do. You could kneel in your meditation on your calves. And then you can, as you're kneeling on your calves and your calves start to hurt, you take your breath and you put your mind in your pain. You look 
at your pain. You enter, you don't run away from your pain. You don't try to stop your pain. You take your breath and your mind and you put it right smack in the middle of the pain and you stare at the pain with all of your breath and all of your mind and all of your focus. And what happens is this, is that you lift above your pain. You just kind of float above it. It doesn't stop the pain. The pain's still there, but you're not there. You're floating above it. And um, it's a super easy practice and anybody can do it and you can learn in a week. And then you'll know how to do this for the rest of your life. And um, I practice it. I've been practicing it and I continue to practice it. It's uh, super easy. So if you have a meditation practice and you use a, a prayer chant, instead of your prayer chant, use your breath and look at your pain. That's it. It's simple. Great. Thank you, Peter. Another question. Peter, fantastic presentation. I know you're also a minister. After having your near-death experiences and spiritually transformative experiences, how do you fit Christ into our expectations of the afterlife? Well, um, long story short, uh, I went to divinity school to study mysticism um, because I needed language to think about it and talk about it. But I'm not, I'm not a faithful person. I'm not a, I'm not a believer. I know I, the reality for me is the car, capital R divine self. That's real for me. Um, so I have uh, used Christian language in order to help my, me along with also, you know, uh, lots of other uh, readings that I've done around the world in mysticism uh, to construct a, a way to think about this. Now, that said, um, I think that the church totally 100% got it wrong and that Jesus is not the only begotten son and that the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Philip, and the Gospel of Thomas in particular, along with the Gospel of John, and also the sayings of Jesus, when you strip away their theological misunderstandings, that Jesus is a wisdom teacher who had singleness of being, who said, and this is the only place that you can find this, is in the King James translation, is when you make your eye single, your body will be filled with light. He was a practitioner of oneness of being. And that the, the salvation he brought wasn't that he took on the sins of all humanity, it's that he took on human form and came to teach us that we are also light. And that this, that the, in the language of Christianity, they use the Christ consciousness. Christ isn't Jesus' last name. Christ consciousness is the, is the panentheistic Higgs boson energy that pervades all things everywhere all the time the divine light is in everything there is and that jesus came as a a master's master to teach this to us and that the church got it completely wrong and i i went to catholic high school and we read a bo all boys school we we were we were uh took a Bible class every year. So I read the gospels. And when I died and came back and opened them up again, he was a different person. He sounded to me like a near-death experiencer. That's how I saw him. That's how I see him. He's much more like a near-death experiencer than he is like the one that they taught me. And so this mistake of the third century, when the the Nicene Creed came along, has colored Christianity ever since. Um, I, I am a minister. I was in the United Church of Christ. I was ordained. I am not now. I'm still ordained. They can't take that away from me, but I, I haven't led a church for a long time. I, I've never called myself reverend. Never, ever do I call myself reverend. I never did. Because I, because I think that the title was separating people would make all sorts of assumptions about who and what i was so i didn't use that and i never told the truth from the pulpit i never said what i just said to you because i was hiding but i think that jesus had christ consciousness in him he was begotten which means he was enlightened made of the same substance that I'm in pursuit of, that we all are made of, and that is everywhere all the time and everything. I hope, I hope that's a, a brief help. 
It is, thank you. Um, another question is, can you recommend any meditation for spiritual awakening, please? Oh, I sure can. Um, two things. Um, let's see if I can. This here, open mind, open heart. I know it's got a cross on the front of it. It's the Theravada Buddhism combined with um, the Cloud of Unknowing. And it, that's a very famous anonymous book, um, Centering Prayer Practice. Because it's not about, the, the practice of centering prayer is the elimination of self. It's the practice of dying before you die, so that when you die, you don't die. It is the, it's not to manifest anything, it's to step aside. It's to learn to silence the thoughts that we have so that we can be in the peace of the presence of beingness now. And it's cumulative. Every breath that you take, every chant that you say, in the moment that you actually have your mind and breath aligned, or when the word, the, the, the word falls away, your prayer chant falls away, and you're left only focusing in your breath, or when even your breath falls away, and you're left focusing only in the presence of the peace, of the silence, all of these things accumulate um, grain by grain until the light becomes living inside of you. Or another metaphor is breath by breath, you peel off the inner layers of your onion and you create a space inside yourself. After I took that mescaline in high school, my religion teacher, he'd gone off to the monastery, St. Joseph's Abbey, which was near my school. And this is in 1977. He learned centering prayer practice. And because I had had this recent non-dualistic experience through psychedelics, I dove into meditation and I've been practicing it since then for 40 years, more than that. And it does what it promises. And the other thing is Kriya, yoga, which you can find in the teachings of uh, Pramah uh, Pramahansa Yogananda on the like the 25th chapter of autobiography, or you can find the roots of that in the Yoga Sutras written by Pantajali. And this interior practice and in Theravada Buddhism practice of single-mindedness and the centering prayer practice of single-mindedness, they all line up. The addition of Kriya is that you work your chakras, but you don't imagine your chakras. You don't try to think what they are. You just plus place your mind and your breath inside them and you learn your, about your subtle body. Because your subtle body, which is what this is, Kriya is all about, is your actual body. I, I, my subtle body is me. My physical body is where, is where my subtle body resides. So Kriya Yoga and Centering Prayer. And centering prayer practice is super simple. And I teach it Tuesdays and Wednesdays. We have a group. And the other thing about it is that this light multiplies itself. And so when you practice in a, uh, uh, I used to go to a Zendo in the, in the Zendo where you practice together, everybody shares the light. And in the monastery, when I've been in the monastic setting, when the, when the monks chant the Gregorian chant, all of their individual light bodies unite into one much larger light body. And this is true at uh, conferences where lots of near-death experiences are. And it's true in meditation groups where group people practice. And so when you practice your meditation in a collective, the light shares itself, your meditation gets deeper and stronger. And it's not just me saying this. It's... Uh, world history. So that's it. That's my little okay, spiel on great. that. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, just before you came back, God said to you, you won't live your life. What does this mean? Well, I, I had to live into that. I didn't, I didn't know what it meant. Um, I was pretty angry because well, as soon as I came back, I knew that I was not myself anymore. Nobody. So those pictures of me in the back of the of the pickup truck and at that dinner in this theater, I don't even know where we were somewhere on the road. Um, I was not myself and I knew that I was not myself. And so I had to try to figure out how to become me again. And I found the way to become me through meditation. The deeper I dove inside myself, the more I found my true self, the more I found my true self, the truer I became to myself, and the more able I was to live in the world as a human being. Um, on the first morning, so 
I didn't tell part of the story. So I totaled Tim's car, my partner's car, my climbing partner's car. I totaled the car on the way home. And we had a very bad wreck in Canada. Um, and I, we split up. And Tim took a lot of the gear and took a bus back to Bozeman. And I hitchhiked. We had enough money for one bus, per, bus pass. And that morning as I stood outside, hitchhiking my way back to Bozeman, there was a roaring inside me. I became aware of this roaring inside me, this very loud voice, always saying my soul name. Oh, I saw, I didn't tell you, I heard my soul name. When I saw the origin of myself, I heard my soul name being spoken, not in language, not in words, but the very being of my existence is this frequency of sound, all metaphor. And that same sound was, resor was, was um, resonating inside of me like a waterfall, loud waterfall, speaking to me. And one, it, what it was saying to me was, you are messenger. And I was like, no, I'm not. Oh, no, I'm not. You took away all my words. You tell me to say this thing and you tell me no words to say it with. So... My life became not mine. I, I, was gonna, I was an English major and I was going to graduate school in architecture um, and to join my family firm. My dad was president of the Architecture Association of Massachusetts and had a firm and my sister was in graduate school in architecture and I was gonna do the same thing. I'd, be, I'd had a pencil in my hand since I was a kid at the drafting board, drawing pen, you know, pen, pen and ink, all sorts of stuff. And uh, all of that went away gone. I lived an entirely different life. I was a different person. Everybody in this theater company I was with, they all thought I was the same person I was before, except for I didn't ride in the van with them. 15 passenger van, 24,000 miles. I brought my sleeping bag and my sleeping pad, and I sat in the back of the pickup truck. Where you saw us, that was one of the few days that anyone else was out there other than me. I, I, I separated myself. I was an alien in my own body. I lived a life where the only stability I have ever found inside myself in my life was by turning inward and aiming the eye of my heart at the eye of the divine. Because only in that place am I, my, am I me. And the more I did that, the more grounded I became in the world. But I, I would never have, I was most reluctant I, I, even as I dove into this and pursued it with all of my being, I was more like Job. I did not want this job. I was pretty angry that I had it. And I was upset that I died and came back. I wasn't upset that I died. I was super mad that I came back at myself. And I felt like God had tricked me. You won't live your life. You're not going to live your life is what I heard. But in reality was, you're going to live for me. That's what it turned out to be. And, 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 and the only way I could do that was by diving interiorly, specifically, and constantly. And so I've lived a pretty dramatic life. Being a minister, uh, maybe you had a minister or a priest when you were growing up. I'm, I am unlike them, um, not only because I'm a mystic, but because of the fearlessness that comes along with this and the kind of ministry that resulted from it. So I've lived a, I haven't lived the life I could have lived, but every single time I had a mystical experience, I, that was true every single time. So in every single mystical experience I had subsequent to that, and as it turns out previous to that too, I became a new person. So I was always being re remade a new person. I was never living the life that I would have lived. And the last thing I'll say about it is that my life 1.0 was completely over. I was, to be, I was to be dead. That's what the divine was inviting me home. Come to us. We want you. Oh, you want to go back? Well, you're not, you can't live the life that you're going to live. You've, you're here. So you're going, to you, you're going to be completely different. That's the only way this works. And that's what happened to me. 
little did I know. Great, thank you. I think we probably have time for one more question, which is, can you speak more about what you said regarding breaking down the walls between NDEs, near-death experiences, and spiritually transformative experiences? Is there a way science can help with that? Oh, well, I'm really, I'm really glad you asked that because that's exactly where I want to land because medical science already is. Medical science is raising the dead. They've been raising the dead for 60 years, creating an army of a nation of tens of millions of near-death experiences around the globe who are compelled to live a different life. And the more that we raise our voices, the more that we free the billions of voices that have had mystical experiences. Science definitely is raising the dead. So there are basically several ways that you can have a mystical experience where you can die. Right? You can have by divine grace, you can have an out-of-body experience or an in-body dwelling that you didn't cause, it just happens to you. Suddenly someone comes to visit you who, and they're dead and they give you uh, noetic knowledge that you can't ever say, but your life has changed forever. There's psychedelics. And I know that that's controversial, and, but the studies that are coming out of John Hopkins University in particular, their transcendental study that's been going on for 10 years, in which a friend of mine was a participant, on which they have created a very rigorous uh, clinical exploration of the end of duality, shows that that's true. And that has always been true. And meditation. You can thin the walls of your life through practice. And that's what I've been doing for my whole life. When I died and came back, I needed to claw my way back to heaven. I had to live in this life, in this body, but I was not going to just stay here. So I plumbed the, and the depth of mystical knowledge globally. And I chose only to read ancient books. That's why I went to graduate school for it. Because I figured that ancient books would have stood the test of time. And their knowledge would have been handed down and handed down and handed down. And the truth is that you can, through meditative practices, strip down the walls inside yourself and create a containment for light inside of you. You can think your way into awakeness. It takes a lifetime. And it happens sometimes in a flash, because the more you thin the walls, the, more, the, the, the fewer the veils are between you and the divine, the more likely the divine grace in Christian language will, will illuminate you from the exterior and pull you up into a divine place. So science is impacting. Um, and science will continue to impact. And if we, if we make it through this terrible time in human history right now without having World War III, and a nuclear exchange, if we only have climate change to face, I know that's only, the 21st century is the first time in the history of the world where there have been so many of us willing to be channels of light and to bring heaven here now. And we're doing this and we're atheists and we're Buddhists and we're Jans and Zoroastrians and Muslims and Christians and, and, and materialists and humanists and rationalists. Once a near-death experience happens, all of that goes away and we become one people of light. And now for the first time in the history of the world, the, this great global awakening, this has been going on starting in the 1960s. We're not going to save the earth. It's not about making the earth, it's, it's not about saving the earth, it's about remaking humanity. It's about the transition that we all experience in the divine presence that leaves a residual light inside us and how this communicates between us without language. And we become the channel in the light net. This is, this is my term, the light net. Like the internet, only it's a spider's web, but it's made of light and it binds us all together. And, it's, and the more of us that bind into the light net, the greater the radiance becomes. And if we have an opportunity to make it through this part of the century, and we have the 21st century during cataclysm, when cultures shatter because cataclysm creates an opportunity for a new culture, we have an opportunity to nudge the world into a new way of being. And the last thing I'll say is that because we have this carbon problem, 
fusion power, if you're not familiar with fusion, it's the opposite of fission. Fusion power has been under development for 40 years all around the globe, hundreds of billions of dollars. They're near to solving the problem. They have, they have, you look it up on the, just Google fusion power, and you're going to see in the last year, major advances have happened. When fusion comes online commercially, we won't be burning carbon anymore. We will have clean, unlimited energy. And when that happens, well, the air will clear. We'll have a clean planet. And, and if we have an opportunity as beings of light to nudge where we are in the, the blossom blue, be the lotus that blooms where you are. Bring the light where you are among the people that you're with. And the more of us that do that, the bigger the net becomes. There are so many of us now. First time in the history of the world. And it is because of science, raising the dead, resuscitation, they call it. That's my... Yeah, thank you so much, Peter. Um, really enjoyed your presentation. And I'm going to turn it over to Yvonne now. Thank you, Peter. That was an absolutely awesome presentation. Thank you very, very, very much. Um, I now, uh, I really think many, many people are going to enjoy uh, watching that video and being inspired and enlightened by the things that you shared today. So thank you very, very much, Peter.